Hello everyone and welcome back to Rocket Science, where I think it's about time we discussed the design reference mission, the basis for the designs that I'm coming up with and their requirements. A design reference mission tells us what it is we need and we design around those requirements. And of course, so far I've been designing these things, uh, this lander and of course the space plane, the Shinkansen space plane, and I haven't really said why they're designed that way, except to give what the requirements are. Of course, uh, this stage, uh, incidentally, I should uh, broach the subject. There is a texture issue with this. The reason why there's a texture issue with this is because Unity limits you to one material per part. Well, it's not just you. I think it's uh, Kerbal Space Program. I forget exactly where the limit of one material per part comes in. But there is a one material per part limitation when importing into Kerbal Space Program. And unfortunately, Blender, uh, sometimes when you have more than one material and you try and get rid of the material, it doesn't really get rid of the material. And that causes problems like this. I've uh, worked around this nozzle problem by having a, a separate part without the engines, as you can see, and then having a separate engine part. So let me just uh, get that working for us here. But this was the initial pressure-fed lander stage that uh, I designed in the very first rocket science video. And it was designed in order to be able to land and take off again from the moon or Mars. And we were deciding exactly what kind of load we could carry with two of these 30 kilonewton engines. The uh, load ended up being about two tons. And uh, so overall, the vessel mass would be uh, 15.26 tons was the limit in order to have a thrust to weight ratio of uh, a little bit more than one. It's like 1.1 something off of Mars, which is pretty bad, but might be good enough to get back into Mars orbit. And so all that was discussed in the first video and we sized it. We de determined the mass of the tanks and the structure and the engines. Um, uh, to give you a sense of the size of this, uh, it might be a good idea to put some sort of pod on top of it. Let's say the Alcor pod, which is about two tons. It's a little bit more than two tons. But you can see the lander stage is quite large. And in fact, I intend to build a, uh, build special payloads for the top of this, including a special pod. Um, the Alcor pod is a little bit involved. Another uh, sort of reference point might be the Apollo um, lunar module. And so I don't know if I have one of those available in here. There are various lander cans here, but I don't think I have the lunar module in here right now unless I've missed it. Uh, though Apollo command module might be a good reference. So this is obviously wider than the Apollo service module, and that's important to note. And then again, the overall lunar module, including its descent stage, was also wider than the Apollo uh, command module. So uh, here's Orion, by the way. So it is smaller than Orion, uh, but uh, the upper thrusters might need some work if we want to actually attach it, which brings me to another possibility, which is using that lander stage as a service module. And I, in fact, have a variant of it like this. It's not, it's boxy because of the elements of the interior, which are exactly the same. But this is a service module version with uh, solar panels and designed for just a single ED1 because you don't need all the extra thrust if you're just using it in space without intending to land. So it's just one and then uh, slots for verniers there. And so yeah, this is another variant of the same design that we will put to use eventually. Though obviously if we want it to uh, match up with a circular base there, we need some sort of adapter. Uh, so there's this system, and then there's the Shinkansen space plane system, and we will be designing other systems. And the motivation for all this, I will show you outside in space. Okay, this is the International Mars Mission. Some of you may have followed my Shuttle Constructed Mars Mission videos, and this is still here. Uh, all the components of this particular mission, which is currently 151 tons, were brought into low Earth orbit by a space shuttle, and so is brought up in pieces of about 20 tons. I want to redesign this and actually get the numbers for how much it would be in terms of mass and everything. Uh, you know, get the actual masses for the modules, for the spacecraft, 
but it is an ion powered uh, system. It has two engines here, which burn methane and oxygen to use as OMS engines. And we will be replacing these with our new ED1 engines that were designed in the first rocket science video. And so they're using methane and oxygen. And instead of the tanks that we have here, we'll be using the tanks that we have designed for our lander system and also for the space plane if we reinforce those because of course they're not structurally sound on their own I think. So we are going to reinforce those and use those tanks as our methane and oxygen tanks but we also need um, xenon gas tanks and so we're going to be uh, figuring out what really is required for those uh, these uh, sequences of spheres may not be the most optimal way of carrying the xenon, we'll see. Um, uh, solar panels will be using ISS analog, so these will be about the same mass. The purpose of this vessel, this huge vessel, is to provide enough uh, crew room to uh, satisfy our crew on their journey to Mars. And using its ion engines, it uh, captures around Mars in a high orbit and then transfers from Mars to Earth and then captures in around Earth in a high orbit and then does the cycle repeatedly. So we go back and forth between Earth and Mars. It had already cycled in that series, in the Shuttle Constructed Mars Mission series, from low Earth orbit to the Moon and then parked around the Moon while we refueled it and got its crew on board because we didn't want to send the crew on board uh, while it was cycling up because it'd be passing through the radiation belts. So we did all that, but uh, I wasn't satisfied with the design overall. Uh, it has some uh, plus sides in that it can spin on its axis, and if you spin it, it can generate artificial gravity in here. So you can generate uh, Mars equivalent gravity pretty easily because of its sheer length, and uh, of course it's got a good counterweight with the engines in the back and the propellant in the back if you keep the propellant uh, sort of more rearward if we call this rearward and uh, generate the artificial gravity like that. So that's a possibility for the trip over there because we do want artificial gravity uh, so that they don't have extra bone loss and other physical effects. And the benefit of this of course is that ion engines are efficient and as long as you're capturing in high orbit you don't need a whole lot of delta V to do that and you don't need to do the full aerobraking. breaking. Um, once it's captured into a high orbit it, uh, the Shinkansen space plane can rendezvous with it and transfer the crew back down to low earth orbit. The purpose of the Shinkansen space plane uh, uh, I think people misunderstood exactly how it's supposed to work. Uh, it's not supposed to just go to lower orbit and come back down and go to lower orbit and come back down like the space shuttle did. That would entail a whole lot of wear and tear and not be the best thing for reusability. Its primary mission is to go from low Earth orbit to high Earth orbit back to low Earth orbit to high Earth orbit repeatedly. And doing uh, mild aerobraking breaking passes high in Earth's atmosphere where the heat is not as intense where it won't put as much stress on the airframe. And doing that, I believe it can be reused quite often for trips between low Earth orbit and, say, the moon, and capturing around the moon and coming back, but not coming back down through the atmosphere. Uh, for coming back down through the atmosphere, the only time it would do that is if it needs some repairs or overhaul, um, which would be a regular thing. You know, it needs regular maintenance, perhaps every five trips between Earth and the moon it would uh, have to come back down. But um, yeah, I, we would try to keep it up in space as long as possible uh, and reuse it like that. And you can see the benefits of that system over say the Orion spacecraft, which is what we have here with a makeshift uh, service module. Orion uh, can only go to the moon and come back once and then has to come straight back down and it has to be reworked and it's very expensive. The Orion spacecraft is very expensive. And uh, of course, then you have to rebuild a new service module because you dumped that and a new transfer stage because you dumped that. Um, with the Shinkansen space plane, you have the service module and space plane uh, and uh, transfer stage built in and you bring those back down for servicing as well. And also it has oh, just two engines, two main engines and then the two OMS engines. So it's fairly spare and the engines I intended 
which I have not designed yet, uh, are gas generator engines. So they're fairly simple, more like Merlin 1Ds than RS-25s. So uh, that would rendezvous with this in high Earth orbit and then bring the crew back down to low Earth orbit where a regular pod like a Dragon 2 will pick them up and bring them back to the surface. In fact, I would suggest that the same sort of mission profile should be used for SpaceX's um, sort of space plane. Um, they call it Starship, but I don't like to use that name because it's not going to a star. I believe, you know, that's false advertising. Uh, so I'll call it BFS. And with BFS, I think it would be best to keep it up in space as much as possible without uh, facing the rigors of bringing it back down constantly. And that it would cycle back and forth between uh, Earth and the Moon or Earth and Mars. And it would stay up and then a Dragon 2 would bring the crew back down. And I think that would be much better than bringing the whole thing back down every single time. Of course, it would still have to be brought down for uh, servicing, as usual. But uh, the more we could develop our capacity to service things in space, the better. And that's something I think we could foster. Now, can we leave a space plane in space for an extended period of time? Well, thankfully, that subject has been broached by the Air Force with their X-37. The X-37 stays up in space for a year and then comes back down just fine. Now, it's not going back and forth between the Earth and Moon and or Earth and Mars, but it does stay in space for an extended period of time and it does not seem to have any problems returning. So if we can keep a space plane up for a year, that would be quite satisfactory for these purposes. So that's the form of reusability we're talking about. Uh, we're not talking about uh, constantly bringing it back and forth between the ground and low Earth orbit. Um, and that's why you want the huge surface area of a space plane, because then you can make those high aerobraking passes in Earth's atmosphere to come back to low Earth orbit uh, gently. And, um, and of course, you can reuse all the components instead of ditching them like Orion does. So you can see the benefits over what we have here. And uh, we need a lander, of course, for Mars or the Moon. And so we are going to be sending that with this as well. So I'm going to design the lander capsule. We also need an ISR unit that we need to design. I cannot design ion engines, so we're going to have to go with existing papers by NASA on ion engine design as far as the uh, performance of those and size and such. And that's why I've used to size these these ion units for Mars. So, yeah. And, well, as far as this design is concerned, we had a few issues. And one of our issues was with the docking ports. Uh, in general, docking ports in Realism Overhaul, which is the thing that changes Kerbal Space Program into something that's usable for more simulation type things, um, the docking ports are fairly heavy because they expect to be pressurized and expect people to be passing through. And uh, so these are common berthing mechanisms and they're very heavy. They're meant for space stations and they have hatches and stuff like that. But we're not using them in that respect, right? They're just connecting modules here. They All they really need is propellant feed lines and they don't need to have the hatch. They don't need to have pressurization to that extent. They don't even need to be round, particularly. And so I have decided, uh, so this video does have a new part, uh, a new design to discuss. And the design that we want to discuss is the design of a propellant only docking port. And you can see, we would have quite a few of those on here, one, two, three, and on down the line because this structure was uh, built piecemeal in 20 ton segments. And you know, we can do that again with another launcher, a conventional launcher, uh, perhaps a Falcon 9 or something like that. And um, yeah, but we would like the docking ports to be less massive so that uh, we could probably cut down a few tons from this spacecraft and improve its delta V and overall performance. So let's take a look at the docking port I've come up with. Okay, you'll have to forgive the post-processing effects. That's more for cinematics and not for looking at a part in detail. But here is the docking port that I came up with. It is uh, two meters in uh, span and uh, along this side it is 1.3 meters. 
It is a diamond shape, partly because uh, the structure of our lander is a diamond up there. And also because I was very frustrated by circular docking ports in not being able to figure out the correct orientation, uh, at least from a distance. I mean, even close up, it's really hard to figure out exactly how you need to rotate in order to line things up properly. And this makes it really easy. Uh, this makes it very easy. Um, and it's androgynous, so basically the facing docking port uh, will have its uh, gap here. This is a, a hole, a cone-shaped hole there. And uh, the cone goes into that hole and vice versa for the other side. This is the camera, and the camera will fit into the slot in the docking port on the other side. And same for the other side. Ideally, there'd be some sort of cross here and there for them to figure out how to line up when manually docking, or I, I don't know how exactly how automa automated docking systems work. Um, on the cone, this would be some sort of soft material here, and uh, uh, over an aluminum base. And there are little rollers here. The rollers are just got, sorry, I'm clicking all sorts of other things that I don't need to be clicking. Um, there are little rollers on there that are just gonna be rubber, and they're gonna be on springs. And they probably should be poking out a little bit more, uh, what they do is, uh, when they hit that cone there, they, they're going to start rolling, obviously, to sort of smooth things along. But because they're on springs, uh, the compression of the springs will be detected and be detected as a contact. And so they'll uh, slide on in there uh, to help guide the docking ports together. And, of course, the other docking port will have its cone going in there as well. Uh, so, after that happens, uh, the docking port secures with the clamps and so this has clamps there uh, and gaps there and the facing docking port will have its clamps go into the slots as you would expect and then the doors open because I, do, I didn't want contaminants getting into the I, I don't know what might be floating around who knows uh, but uh, especially close to the space station there's all sorts of little stuff floating around and so we have doors in front and then um, the bigger pipes are the inlet pipes, and these are the pipes that go out. This is very similar to a garden hose sort of situation, except they have to be able to release easily, right? I mean, so I haven't dealt with all the mechanism. These clamps look fancy, but really, uh, the way things are actually secured together on a real docking port are much more complicated than this, and the hoses would also have to have ways of securing together and releasing easily. The releasing easy, easy easily part is uh, sometimes the trickier part. Um, yeah, so, but in principle, we have three propellants. Um, well, I mean, technically, uh, methane, oxygen, helium, right? So that we've got the helium for the pressurization of the tanks. And so this will be able to transfer them in and out. And uh, as long as the docking port is properly lined up, um, the hoses will match. And so that's the idea. Uh, so the correct hoses will match with the, uh, so the inlet hoses will match with the outlet hoses on the other side. Yep, that's the idea in principle. Now let's take a look at the math for how heavy this is, because one thing we wanted to do was cut down on the mass of the docking ports. The mass of the shuttle's docking port it was 267 kilograms or something on that order. Um, now that's just the docking port, not the airlock. Uh, it it does include the hatch for people to get in and out of. This obviously no hatch. And the nice thing about this is is we can also use it as a mating device for uh, if there's a capsule on top, the capsule might have RCS thrusters. Rather than have the tanks in the capsule, we will have the tanks here and then just feed the propellant into the capsule, uh, into the lander can. Uh, so that we can feed its RCS thrusters. The reason we might want to do that is because these top-facing RCS thrusters might get, you know, might not be suitable for whatever lander cam we have on top, depending on its size and you know ladders and stuff like that. This is this design is a little bit cumbersome as far as getting landers uh, ladders around it and making sure people can get off properly. I think the ladders probably gotta go over here and down, but yeah. It's still a little bit awkward. Um, yeah, uh, let's take a look at the math. Okay, so we've got a propellant-only docking port, and its structure is whoop, 
His structure is going to be aluminum 2024, which we've been using so far, just for simplicity's sake. Um, uh, I used Blender to calculate its area. And so again, uh, we've got the model here and we've got this print 3D thing and we can calculate the volume and area like that. So we got the surface area and that was 3.9 meters squared. And then the cone, the little cone on top is another little bit of extra area because that was a separate part. And the hinges, which will be made out of a different material, titanium, um, we've got two rows on, a, on each docking port, uh, seeing again. Uh, we've got uh, this row over here and that row over there and all of them are the same uh, Each row is the same part in as far as blender is concerned So uh, we got the volume of those and the surface area and also the pipes Now that doesn't cover everything, but we'll give some leeway. I'll show you. I just uh, Basically added 10% for actuators and 10% for cushioning I figure that the face of the docking port probably should be cushioned maybe some sort of Kevlar on top of some foam or something. I don't know. Uh, possibly whatever they use for part of the Bigelow Airspace inflatables. There's probably some cushioning inside. Uh, so yeah, uh, we will need some of that. But anyway, uh, structure doesn't need to be pressurized, right? We don't need that. The pipes do. The pipes need to be able to uh, be pressurized in order to feed the flow, but that's separate. Um, we're going to size the structure, assuming that it can take 30 psi, just as a reference. And we're going to pretend, even though it's a diamond shape, that it is a 1 meter radius cylinder. And so the thickness, if it's a 1 meter radius cylinder, taking uh, 30 psi, which is 206.8 kilopascals, divided by the yield stress of aluminum, which is 390 times 10 to the 6th pascals, divide by 1.5, which is our safety factor, gives us a thickness of 0.795 millimeters, and I'm just gonna go with one millimeter uh, for extra safety, I guess. Um, I think that's reasonable. Um, this is, I mean, unless people are gonna slam into it really hard because they're really bad at docking, uh, I think it'll be all right. So going with one millimeter thick plate, uh, we get uh, we take the areas that we had up there, multiply by one millimeter, get the volume, multiply by the density of aluminum, and we get 11.75 kilograms of aluminum. Uh, the hinge is titanium, and the area of the hinges, uh, this is the little cylinders, uh, taking a look. Uh, we're talking about um, these brackets, the cylinders that they're on, and the rest of the hinge itself. So all of that. And um, that's the surface area. We assume a thickness of five millimeters. So they're pretty thick and strong. And we get a volume of 0 0.004 meters cubed times the density of titanium, which is 4.43. And we get 17.7 .7 tons. Uh, we're pretending the pipes are aluminum for now. I'm not entirely sure what material would be best for transferring flows. Maybe aluminum would be fine, but maybe something else. But um, given that, we have the volume of the pipes and uh, the density of aluminum, and that gets us to 7.5 kilograms. So that, that's pretty heavy, and we're probably overestimating the volume of the pipes there. I think it's uh, when we have it in Blender, it's really making them quite thick. Um, that's probably down to my modeling more than anything else. I really do need to figure out how much flow we get through the pipes, but it's not really urgent. The use cases for our propellant only docking port, we're not really transferring the fuel very quickly. It's not like the shuttle's external tank feeding into the shuttle's engines. Though I did think about using this docking port as the means by which the, the Shinkansen space plane carrier plane feeds fuel into the space plane, right? There has to be a system whereby the carrier plane feeds fuel into the space plane because the space plane initially is using the fuel, fuel from the carrier plane. Um, using these ports in order to do that would be simple, uh, but can it feed the fuel quickly enough? That's the one use case where that's important. Otherwise, we're not really going to be pumping fuel very quickly. The most uh, time sensitive thing would be RCS thrusters on any sort of lander can but the RCS thrusters aren't gonna need fuel that quickly. So, but we'll have to check out the flows for that. 
But anyway, we get when we sum up all the masses here, a mass of 37 kilograms, 0.037 tons, and then I add 10% for actuators and 10% for cushioning to get 44.4 kilograms. Now, is that a reasonable mass? Well, I think so for our situation. And let's go back and see some of the other docking ports we have. The problem is a lot of the docking ports that we have are sort of shot in the dark situations. The one that's very definite is APAS, which is uh, the one on the shuttle, and that has 286 kilograms. It's like this, but again, it is a pressurized tube with a hatch and all sorts of mechanisms to ensure that when people pass through it, uh, nothing goes wrong. Now, our docking port here really needs to be secure when things undergo thrust, right? The lander is going to actually be trying to land on the surface of Mars, and this needs to be able to make sure that it can bear the loads and the stresses uh, between it and the lander can. Uh, so between the lander stage and the lander can. So that is an important factor. Uh, the docking ports that we've had before, like APAS, uh, didn't need to undergo that kind of stress like uh, on landing. But they needed to have other stuff going on too. So that's very heavy. That's about seven times the mass of this docking port, maybe six times, six, seven times the mass of this docking port. We have an existing propellant only docking port in Realism Overhaul, and it is 100 kilograms. But that, again, is really a shot in the dark sort of thing. I think I've somewhat justified my calculations here, somewhat. We'll try and justify it a little bit more. Uh, we have various other docking ports that are, this NASA docking system is 0.2 tons. And uh, if we take a look at the Apollo docking mechanism, this is just 36 kilograms for the command module docking probe. But then I don't think that includes the hatch. Uh, so, and then there's also the drogue side for the, for the LEM. Um, common, birthing common birthing mechanism, which is what we're using on the International Mars mission that I showed you earlier, uh, is 250 kilograms. So you can see switching to this kind of port would be a huge benefit. We'd be cutting off 200 kilograms per port. I, 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 I feel like I, I'm, I'm okay with this, but whenever I get a mass, I always do sort of a sanity check. And so I'm thinking whether this is sane or not. But and I wonder if there's a reason for them to be circular that I haven't quite considered. I believe it's mainly for the pressurization, but there might be some other reason that I haven't considered that you guys might know. Because I'm not an engineer. Let me re reiterate that. I'm not an engineer and I haven't taken any engineering classes. So there's a lot that I don't understand. But back to the calculations. Okay, so I've been looking at the book Space Mission Analysis and Design in order to get an idea of how to calculate stresses and loads, but I think it's overdoing it in some ways. Uh, the calculations they presented work pretty well for the pressurized tanks on the lander in that we don't have to change them at all. Um, it seems like they're just fine. But when you get to thinner th tanks and stuff like the airframe of the Shinkansen space plane or the shuttle or a Falcon 9, it's pretty obvious that uh, those calculations are overdoing it. And the real thing, if you will, uh, in the case of the Space Shuttle and the Falcon 9, is thinner than those equations would suggest. So, and I guess that's the reason why people use uh, computational methods like finite element analysis in order to figure out where they really need to have more thickness and where they don't. Otherwise, if you just use an equation, um, you're going to be going with the worst case scenario for the entire thing and you're going to end up really heavy. But uh, for now, uh, it's not always clear exactly what equation applies for what, but I think for the hinge stress, I decided to use its uh, compressive strength equations. And so there's this factor called phi. I think that's phi, right? Uh, as far as Greek letters, which is 1 16th, the square root of the radius divided by thickness. And then you put it into this equation to get another factor called gamma. And so you take that phi, put it up here, e to the negative phi, and then one minus that, and then multiply by this, and you get gamma. I don't know why, but that's the equation they gave. Now, we're doing this for two different elements. 
the cylinder in the middle and then the sort of bracket cylinder on the on the outer side. So the cylinder in the middle is what turns and then the outer bracket is what it turns in. I'm not entirely, this is probably not a good idea because uh, we, we don't really have any way to oil these things. <laughs> well, I don't know. I have an image of uh, astronauts going out to lubricate these hinges, but um, yeah, th there's a lot of additional complexity that needs to happen before this is going to work. But in principle, let's just go along with this. So we get the gamma for each of these, and then we can calculate the critical buckling stress. And so we start with the inner cylinder here, and that's what this sigma CR is is the critical buckling stress equals to 0.6 times the gamma times the modulus of elasticity, E, uh, which you can look up for any material, uh, times the thickness divided by the radius. And so we get that. And the modulus of elasticity for titanium is 110, uh, 110 billion pascals. And so that's what we've got here. And so we get... Uh, buckling stress of 222.2 million pascals, megapascals. We do the same calculation for the outer cylinder, and we get a lower number, which you probably should expect, uh, 184 megapascals. And so we're going to go with the outer cylinder. So using the outer cylinder, since it has a lower critical stress, uh, we calculate the cross-sectional area and uh, multiply, multiply that by the critical stress and we get 124 kilonewtons. And so we just take the area, the cross-sectional area, and multiply it by the critical stress. And we get 124 kilonewtons, which I will note, though I don't know if this is the important thing to note here, uh, the critical buckling load for a single hinge, right, there's just one hinge, is greater than the maximum thrust of our lander or OMS engines, in the case of the space plane, by a factor of greater than two. Not the main engines on the space plane. That's a different story. Hopefully, you are not going to fire the main engines on the space plane when docked to something. And obviously, if we were to use the docking port in order to transfer fuel between the two space plane, the, the um, carrier plane and the space plane, we would not have the docking port carry the load. <laughs> we would probably have some other structure uh, dealing with the loads in that situation on our huge international Mars mission, the ion engines ship, that's also using the same OMS engines and still using two of them. So it's gonna have the same OMS thrust. We don't need to worry about the thrust on the ion engines because that's piddling. It is, uh, it's not gonna put much stress on anything. The stress on the o from the o OMS engines is gonna be much more than that. Uh, but I'm not sure how to sum up the limits for multiple hinges. We got 16 altogether uh, when everything is fully docked or account for other vehicle loads. Now, the book does offer many different ways of doing this, but uh, let's take a look at the cylinder applied loads for the lander. So the lander is 15.29 tons and it gives three different kinds of loads, axial, lateral, and the bend bending moment. And we take the weight multiply by the distance, axial and lateral don't have a distance associated bending moment. I use the radius of the lander. If you take the lander, it's basically all fits in around four meters in diameter. And so it's two meters radius. There is a load factor. I don't know how they get this. Um, 6.5 for the axial, three for lateral, three for bending moment. And they get these limit loads, which are in Newtons. So we just multiply across to get those. And um, the, this has to be like the worst case scenario situation. Uh, and this is, this is where you would really like to have computational analysis of some kind to actually figure out the loads on each uh, particular area of the vessel because this gets to be really big numbers. Uh, equivalent axial load is the axial one here plus two times the bending moment divided by the radius. So we take that uh, 975 kilonewtons plus two times 900 kilonewtons divided by two, and we get the equivalent axial load. And then the ultimate load is that load multiplied by 1.25 for a safety margin. And so we get 2.344 times 10 to the six newtons. So that's obviously above the hinge limit, for one hinge at least. Um, if we calculate all 16 hinges, it isn't, but I don't think that's how that works. Uh, so, well, actually, it's pretty close on the 16 hinges thing. But um, 
I have no idea whether this calculation makes any sense or not for calculating the loads and the stresses on a hinge, uh, especially in this sort of complicated situation with all the hinges going on. And, you know, are they the only ones uh, bearing the load? Uh, when you look at the model, uh, there is the hinge stress, right? Uh, that, that would be more like a sideways stress, right? If something is uh, going sideways, transverse, but uh, in the th direction of thrust, it's actually this plate, the front plate here, that's bearing the stress. And that's uh, distributed in a diamond shape, which unfortunately the book's always like a cyl cylindrical shape. So that's another thing. So if I can get input on how to calculate the stresses and loads on a docking port like this, that would be wonderful because I'm obviously at a loss. It looks good. I mean, it has the benefit of looking good and being less massive than the docking ports we've used before. But is it correct? That is the question. So I'll get your input on that. Um, now, there are a few other elements to remind you of as far as our system is concerned. Okay, so this is the tank for the carrier plane. And it's 20 meters long and 3.67 meters in diameter, right? That goes inside what the carrier plane so that it can loft the space plane to a great enough height and velocity so the space plane can do the rest to get to low Earth orbit. But recall, once in low Earth orbit, the space plane has to be refueled. And it was sized to be refueled by an SLS or a BFS on one launch. It's got about 100 tons of fuel, 108 or so. And uh, so it's meant to be uh, refueled either by an SLS or a BFS in one launch. SLS Block 1B. Um, and in the case of BFS, that's fine because it carries methane and oxygen anyway. So that's a good deal. But we don't need the heavy lift launcher to refuel it in one launch. We could use a lighter launcher to lift it in multiple launches. And it would be super convenient. And unfortunately, this is a cluster of tanks. But the tank we're really interested in is uh, this one right here. That's not on the right note anyway. Um, this tank right here would be the upper stage. And this tank would be the lower stage for a launcher that could deliver fuel to a fuel depot in orbit that had zero boil off and large solar panels to power uh, the zero boil off system, the cryogenic cooling. And that fuel would just be stored in orbit for the Shinkansen space plane. And we would just continually launch this launcher to launch that up. And we would also use the same launcher to launch up the lander, which can't go in the space plane. It was originally supposed to go in the space plane, but we can't do that. So we launched the lander on this sort of rocket. But I have to design the engines first and also figure out how much we need to reinforce these tanks in order to make them work out for a launcher tank. Because right now, they're very optimistic as far as their dry mass and wet mass. But that was justifiable because they were inside the space plane uh, on their own. I don't think they are structurally sound enough to be a launcher tank. So I'll have to take a look at how to mass them out. But uh, we are not abandoning uh, regular old launchers. What we're doing is we're using the tanks that we already have. So these, tank, uh, these tanks up here, the ones that are going to be on the upper stage, will also be used on our International Mars mission. That's what's, uh, these are what will contain the fuel on that for the OMS engines. And, and also when the shuttle, the Shinkansen space plane or the lander docks to the main mission, that huge assembly, uh, it, they will detank. And they will detank into uh, this tank on the mission because this tank will have the zero boil off system and have the cryogenic cooling on that and so uh, because it's got the huge solar panels to power that and so they'll only be fueled when they need to be fueled that way they don't have to carry you know all the extra equipment to have zero boil off so yeah that's uh, the idea in principle if you have any other questions please do ask i've thought about this a fair amount and you know there's obviously a lot more work to be done uh, Every, uh, even little bits like docking ports can have a huge effect 
on the success or failure of the system. So we want to take a look at each individual subsystem and see what we can do with it, whether we can make it lighter, and, and that includes the launch system for the fuel too. So with that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.